This is an example of uh, one of the cone beam CT scan machines. This happens to be the one that's in my office. And that has taken the barrier away from having to send our patients out to a radiology center. I'm not suggesting that people go out and get a cone beam CT scan for their office. I'm suggesting that this is another way to remove some of the barriers that we have in being able to image our patients. Having this tool gives me tremendous, tremendous opportunity to be able to evaluate my patients to a level that I, I could not achieve, at least with uh, such um, immediate access to the technology. So let me show one final case. This is a case of what I, what I refer to as um, a, an all-inclusive type case because it's going to review many of the concepts that I've just described. And this is a congenitally missing lateral case um, for both the tooth number 7 and tooth number 10, the right and left lateral incisors. As you can see by the periapical x-rays that we have here, the right side has a very, very limited room. The apexes of these roots are basically coming together. And of course, we would rather have them be divergent and not be convergent so that we have enough room to place our implant. On the patient's left side, we have a minimal amount of room, although there's certainly a much more favorable type of root proximity than we have on the patient's right side. So my question is, would you trust this technology? Here's the panoramic radiograph. What are we really looking at here? What are we really looking at in this, in this area here? We know the distortion factors of panoramic radiographs. We know the distortion factors of periapical radiographs. We know all of the artifacts that we can have with this two-dimensional technology. Would you really trust this technology to place implants into a young, in this case, 16-year-old individual who is congenitally missing laterals and trust that you're not going to be uh, impinging upon vital anatomy like the adjacent roots of, of the teeth on the canine and the central incisors. When we look at the clinical presentation, we can clearly see that we have a concavity on either side because we're, we're missing the root eminence. We have vertical dimension problems here, interarch space problems, and other problems that I think we can see more clearly if I blow this image up and we give a retracted view. We can see the demarcation between attached and unattached tissue. And when I scribe this line here, we can that it is a telltale sign of what's going on. And in fact, if we use our fingers to palpate this area, we can actually feel the convergence of the canine root into the space that we, we really require to place an implant. And of course, we can do the same thing on the patient's left side. And here's where the triangular bone concept really has impact. Because once we take our CT scan to evaluate that site, we can start to evaluate and use this tool to see if we, we are in, within that zone. And when we want to be within that zone, we can clearly demarcate this through the cross-sectional imaging and the development of this technology through the use of the interactive software applications that we have today. So if we overlay the triangular bone in this area, we can see that we have, in fact, a large percentage of this triangle has bone within it. But if you take a real close look, you can see that the facial part or the buccal part, there is some bone that is missing. Of course, because this is a congenitally missing lateral site and we are missing the volume of bone that would have been taken up by that tooth and the root eminence. When we look at the contralateral side, tooth number 10, we can see that from a facial lingual dimension, it is actually there is less bone here on the patient's left side than there was on the right side. We still have the concavity, and now perhaps we have to start making some decisions. And so the triangular bone concept gives us that tool, the tool to be able to see whether we're within that zone, and then we have to start utilizing that tool to assess these areas. As an example, we can fill this in with some colorization to be able to determine whether we're going to fill that defect in with bone, with soft tissue, perhaps a block bone, perhaps particular bone, and but we have to have the tool to be able to make those decisions. So the decision tree that we can evaluate with revolves around this triangle. And so if I can go through some of these steps, I hope I will make it a little bit more clear. As we can see, we can develop that triangle of bone, in this case for the right 
lateral incisor, tooth number seven. And the first thing we're going to do with that triangle is we're going to evaluate the available bone. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to determine if there's enough bone within that triangle of, of bone zone, if there's enough bone there, um, can we place an implant successfully? We can evaluate the Hounsfield units, the bone density values, utilizing the interactive software, and we can determine the quality of the bone, not only the volume of the bone in that area. There's also a concavity which can be filled, as I mentioned earlier, with either soft tissue, a free, free gingival graft, um, with particulate bone, with a block graft, or many other types of treatment options that we have today with guided bone regeneration. <clears throat> When we move a little bit further, we're not, we're not done with our decisions yet, because now we have to go a little bit further. We have to evaluate this concavity and determine whether we're going to do something with it, but we also have to now take it to the next level, because utilizing this wonderful technology, we can actually determine the exact width and length of the implant that we can place within that triangle of bone, and within the available bone within that triangle. We can actually also make a determination whether we want to use a straight walled implant or we want to use a tapered type of design implant. And certainly there may be some indications for either one of those. With some of the new one-piece implant designs, we might want to utilize a one-piece design which has the abutment attached to the implant itself as a one-piece. Or we may want to stay with a conventional two-piece design implant or two-stage implant. Then, of course, then again, we want to look at that concavity to determine whether we're going to, what kind of uh, procedure we're going to use to replace that missing vital anatomy. Now, of course, some people look at cross-sectional slices and it means something to them, and some people look at cross-sectional slices and it may mean a nice piece of cake for dessert. These are the two most important slides that I may be showing in this brief presentation. And this is where we can evaluate the axial view. In other words, we're looking perpendicular to the roots of the tooth, and as we can see, there are, we can clearly see the morphology of the roots of these teeth. And when we look at the morphology of the roots of these teeth, it, it, it should immediately come to mind that none of these roots are round. And yet we have this daunting task to take a round implant, place it into this site, and somehow develop a beautiful emergence profile. When of course a round implant does not represent the morphology of the shape of the root that we're replacing. If we look at the right part of the screen, we can also see that the, the central incisors are not perfectly parallel to each other. And in fact, one is actually tilted immediately into or distally into the space that is required by this implant. And so if we look at the literature over the years, we know from various authors like Tarnow and like Maurice and Henry Salama and David Garber and many others that are out there looking at the work of Joseph Kahn at Loma Linda and, and other authors that look at implant to tooth relationships and implant to implant relationships. We have to now look at those two-dimensional studies and two-dimensional research and now start to correlate it to three-dimensional CT scan-based research to be able to truly evaluate that positioning of an implant to a natural tooth. Because certainly if we took a periapical x-ray, we would never see what we're looking at here on the axial image, where we can clearly indicate on this central incisor, when we want to place this implant to number seven, if we took a periapical x-ray, we may see something entirely different than we're looking at here, because now we can see that space that surrounds that tooth root, and of course that is the PDL and the lamina dura. And when we can evaluate this and blow it up and see that we may be very, very close to impinging upon that very vital piece of anatomy that may change our treatment protocol. And so this technology really is, is eye-opening when it comes to being able to evaluate in all of the dimensions available to us today. So we're going to start out with that 
cross-sectional image, but that's not where we're going to end. We're go we have to follow through with the axial image, and then we're going to follow through with three-dimensional images as well. When we look at the only piece of research that I can find recently that actually uses cone beam CT, and that is an article by uh, Kelly Mish and, and David Sarmand, Accuracy of Cone Beam Computed Tomography for Periodontal Defect Measurements, I think the world is starting to move into this area as a tool to be able to assess patient anatomy. We're going to take it one step further here, and we're going to go into the world of 3D. Because now when we have beautiful three-dimensional reconstructions, we can see and clearly evaluate the concavities that exist on the right side and the left side. We can go in and we can place our implants and make sure that they don't perforate through the facial plate of the bone. We can utilize this to now strip away the bone entirely and give us an unobstructed view of the root structure. And as you can see very clearly here, this is, this is a beautiful view, stripping away all of the bone, and we now can see that we have a dilacerated root that has a little bit of a tilt towards the distal, and in fact, if we use a straight-walled implant, would be be impinging upon that vital piece of anatomy. And so these are the tools that we use today, and these are the tools of the future. So now we can simulate the placement, not in 2D, but in 3D. We can see how much blue sky or how much room we have available between root and implant. And now we can really evaluate that relationship, not from a two-dimensional periapical x-ray, but from a three-dimensional image, rotating these images and being able to blow this up and see exactly how much space is in between these vital structures. And then we have to ask ourselves the next question. When we place this implant, are we going to place it freehand or are we going to utilize some sort of a template so to prevent us from impinging accidentally on these vital pieces of anatomy? We might then want to use manufacturing-specific implants. These allow us to be able to assess the real implant that we may use to see if we have enough room between the threads and the adjacent tooth roots. And today, we have the technology to be able to do that. And here you see this implant that is placed in this area. It's a manufacturer-specific implant, and it is a tapered design, which may, in fact, give us a little bit more room where we need it at the apex. We also see the technology developing where we can start to incorporate virtual teeth because the goal, of course, is the tooth. And so if we don't have a barium sulfate template, we may then look at creating a virtual tooth to be able to assess the position of the implant, the restorative component in this case, which would be the abutment, and then, of course, the emergence profile of the tooth that we're going to replace. Virtual teeth is a work in progress, but I think it will be a very, very valuable tool in the future. You can see here we can evaluate the trajectory of the implant, the trajectory of the abutment as it perforates here through the incisal facial aspect of the clinical crown. And we can look at this from several different viewpoints. And as we can see and rotate this, we can look at the lingual aspect. And now we can go back to the patient with tremendous clarity. Because there shouldn't be any surprises. And I don't like to have any decisions that I want to make at the time of surgery. I'd rather have all of the decisions made prior to the surgical intervention. So now we've removed the brackets from this particular patient. We can see that the concavities are still there, of course. But we have a better unobstructed view because the brackets are removed. And when we go ahead and we're going to create a flap design because we're going to, we're going to try to create a root eminence in these areas by using bone grafting or soft tissue grafting, we have to create some sort of a flap. And when we look at the CT scan image from a occlusal position, when we flap back this tissue on the real patient, what we expect to see is a, a crest of bone width on the right side and a lack of crestal bone width on the left side. And when we actually do that with the patient, we flat back the tissue, that's exactly what we see. There should be no surprises. So we have a wider crest of the bone here on the patient's right side and we have much less of a crest here on the patient's left side. Taking that data and sending it via email, we can then create through the use of templates. This particular template is designed as a surgery guide for materialize created by Simplant. And when we create this template, it has embedded within it five millimeter stainless steel tubes. 
each one specific to the drill sequence that we're going to utilize. And this is a tremendous innovation as well because the decisions have been made. This is a tooth point template. All we need to do is get the drill into the hole. And we're going to use sequential drills as the manufacturer suggests. So we're going to use several different templates that correspond to the particular drill diameter that we're going to use for this particular patient and these particular sites to create the osteotomies exactly where we want them to be placed. As the implants are going in, now we can start to pay attention to that anti-rotational feature, which in this particular case is the internal connection. This implant is not fully seated yet, which gives me an idea, though, and it may be difficult to see in this presentation, but we can evaluate where that flat of the hex will reside, and we have a clear indication of the concavity that we still have to deal with later. Okay, so we're going to see the actual surgical intervention here in a quick little video. What we're going to see is the site that's exposed at this point. We're going to go in and we're going to utilize sequential drilling. So now if we take a look at the technology in terms of the planning aspect, we can start to appreciate that if we look down upon that implant, we can see the anti-rotational feature in the virtual part of this program here it allows us to be able to show where this implant is rotated. And here you see that the apex of this hex is pointed towards the facial. Well, we want the flat of the hex towards the facial. And we can utilize the virtual tools in the interactive software application, such as Simplant, to be able to point the flat of the hex towards the facial. Once we're able to do that, that opens up another whole world of being able to connect to the restorative component. And here we see where the dot on the prefabricated abutment correlates to the dot correlates to the flat of the hex on the facial. And we have already have a predefined margin in this area, and we can then create the proper tooth that sit on top of this. This is a CAD-CAM generated Atlantis abutment that we utilized to be able to complete this case. However, when we created this particular case, we did not have to go to an impression process. The future of what we're doing today is going to be that we'll be able to plan totally in a virtual world, and instead of having an abutment projection, as you see here in yellow, we're going to be able to have a CAD-CAM generated virtual abutment created through the software application that will then be ported off to a company like uh, an Atlantis who will create a CAD-CAM generated abutment that will allow us to have site-specific, tooth-specific abutments that will allow us to be able to restore our patients with greater accuracy and greater precision. As you can see, the margin on the facial is where we want it. The margin on the facial of tooth number seven is completely different than it is on tooth number 10 because every tooth position is going to be different. And as you can see here from the different views, we can create a custom CAD-CAM abutment that will allow us to deliver a customized approach for every tooth that we replace. When we look at the post-operative periapical x-rays, we can see the excellent result that we've achieved on both the right and the left side. Although on the right side, it looks like we're very, very close to that canine tooth. But of course, that's because we're looking at a two-dimensional periapical x-ray. If we change the angle slightly, we can see that in this area, we did have plenty of bone between the apex of the implant and the adjacent canine tooth. So this is what we started with for this particular patient. After the brackets had been removed, we can see the concavities that exist in this area, and this is what we finished with for this particular patient. We were able to maintain and develop interdental papillas, an emergence profile, root eminences, and this patient was restored to a very nice functional and aesthetic result all through the planning and the use of CT imaging, three-dimensional imaging, the use of virtual teeth, the use of virtual CAD-CAM implants and abutments, and afforded by the technology that we have today. So I've described for you in this brief time together that we've had the concept of the triangular bone. I hope that you will use this concept to be able to expand your diagnostic abilities when you plan your cases in the future. Articles that you can also look at um, recently in PPA and D in the July issue, uh, CT derived model based surgery for immediate loading of maxillary implants takes it one step further by actually looking at that triangle bone concept in place replacing four uh, immediate 
extracted teeth, 7, 8, 9, and 10, in the very highly aesthetic zone of the maxilla. Uh, other articles from the Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, this was published in September of 2005, Restoratively Driven Solutions for Dental Implants, and of course the first article that was really written on the use of stereolithography uh, was also published in PPAND um, back in 2003. Thank you very much for your kind attention.